I was invited here to talk about spying during the American Revolution. Now here's the problem. There was no spying during the American Revolution. <laughs> so uh, you can sit down, it's, it's, just stay here. Uh, but basically before, before everyone gets up to leave, very annoyed at me and having lured them out here on false pretenses, just let me clarify a little bit. There was in fact a lot of spying during the American Revolution. It's just that no one talked about it until quite recently. So it seemed as if there wasn't any. Indeed, the, very, the, the person who did the most spying during the revolution is the very same person who was considered to have done the least, if any. And I'm referring, of course, to one George Washington Esquire, who it turns out positively enjoyed spying the daylights out of the British. Far from being the whippersnapper who couldn't tell a lie, he actually told a great many of them, and he smiled as he did so. And so nowadays, as a result, it's common knowledge that uh, Washington was a first-class intelligencer, as uh, spy masters were kind of known in those days. The real mystery being, why did it take so long to figure this out? Personally, I, bl I blame one dollar George. He's that starchy, upright, older gentleman with the bad teeth who peers at you knowingly from the bill you just put into the one dollar bill, you just put into the tip jar at the local coffee place, or until quite recently in the rise of tipping, and uh, you used to put into the, uh, the tip jar at the coffee place. Uh, now you get looked at as being a, a cheapskate. He is the stern patriarch of the nation, the founder of the great republic, the Augustus who became a Cincinnatus often depicted in a toga bearing like Moses, a sacred tablet handed down from the heavens and engraved the American Constitution, Washington's virtues were many, and spying, a grubby little business, could certainly not be among them, at least according to every patriotic historian of the old school. In their time, espionage, at least certain forms of it, was regarded as being both uh, below the salt and below the belt. Below the salt, because spying had a terrible reputation uh, for being the province of ill-bred scoundrels, and below the belt, because gentlemen played by Queensbury rules and did not resort to things like eavesdropping, snitching, and cheating to win. In these respects, they resembled those noble knights of yore who'd looked down on the low-born musketeers whose vulgar bullets had turned their suits of armor into coffins. Put simply, Washington as a secular saint, could hardly be portrayed as having a whiff of sulfur about him, and that meant he could not have spied. Washington had to win his wars and be seen to win his wars on the up and up. If spies, uh, Washington's spies, uh, spying was uh, long the great unsayable, then in recent years it has become perhaps the too often said. It's become a shibboleth that Washington, the essential founding father, was also the founding father of American intelligence. There's a lot to be, you know, something to be said for that, but that's actually one of the reasons why there's a, a famously, there's a statue of Nathan Hale outside of Langley. Uh, someone once told me that uh, the CIA director, uh, William Casey, used to get annoyed about why they were celebrating someone who got caught. But I think, with the greatest respect to the late Mr. Casey, I think he kind of missed the point. As America's first spy, sort of, Hale serves as the intel equivalent of Abraham to Jews. From him descends, from his covenant with Washington, an unbroken line of service that began in 1776 and continues to the present, it seems. Thus the CIA, indeed the modern intelligence community, has its origins in the revolution, with Washington serving as a kind of its first proto-director. You know, it's, uh, it's tempting to believe that, um, but honestly, it's, it's, uh, it's a kind of it's almost as false a god as Baal. Aside from some cosmetic similarities, 18th century spying has very little in common with its modern variant, uh, which I'm sure you'll be hearing about much more in the next couple of days. The reason for these two extremes, too little, uh, too little attention and then too much, is that in both cases, intelligence during the War of Independence isn't looked at with much historical perspective. So when we talk about, as the title of this uh, talk is, I think, intelligence during the American Revolution, we have to remember not to retrofit our own conceptions on those of a lost and alien past. And which is why, before anything else, we need to know what spying was like in the era of the American Revolution before we can understand what it was like during it. Which brings me rather neatly to part one, intelligence in the era of the American Revolution. And just excuse me. So, put simply, there are three basic 
characteristics of late 17th and 18th century espionage that distinguish it from today's form. The first was that spies of whatever stripe worked for a patron, a great man, a jefe. This setup descended from the Renaissance era style of personal rule that but had come to reflect the politics of, at a time when parties had not yet quite formed, and so loyalties were dictated by personal affinity and private ambition. Success hinged on retaining the patron's interest by rendering useful services, as it was put at the time, and crossing your fingers that his fortunes continued to prosper. A fine example of what happened when a patron moved on in one way or another is provided by Jean-Baptiste Colbert, who was Louis XIV's controller general of finance, uh, and also, as it happened, his chief spy. This was a time when there was a shift away from citing received wisdom as a source of authority and towards using hard information to help make decisions. Colbert's great achievement was to create an encyclopedic state intelligence system that harvested big data. It's kind of the Palantir and Google of its time. His agents cast their nets wide, drawing in colossal amounts of information from neighboring realms on their finances, demographics, laws, land holdings, election results, army commanders, and the family trees of the leading noble families. Now, this was all advanced stuff, except that it was the slave of one man's patronage. So when Colbert died of a kidney stone, his successors couldn't hope to manage the vast database he'd, managed, he'd amassed, and it fell into decrepitude. At one point, it was even being directed exclusively towards suppressing irreverent gossip about the king's numberless mistresses. The same thing happened with the so-called black chambers. These were secret offices that specialized in intercepting, opening, forging, and decrypting diplomatic and domestic correspondence. Though ostensibly run by the government, they in fact reported always to a single master, and their sway hinged on his continuing interest. Under Prince Kaunitz, the state chancellor of Austria, for nearly four decades, from 1753 to 1792, the Habsburg uh, Black Chamber was remorselessly efficient. This was mostly owed not only to Kaunitz's desire to be the best informed man in Europe, but also his proximity to the Empress Maria Theresa, who took an equal interest in reading other people's letters. After her death and his resignation, however, the Black Chamber declined in tandem with its Baroque empire. Now, the lesson we can draw from this is that the great difference between then and now was that then there was no impartial institutional foundation for intelligence gathering and evaluation. So when the boss went, along with his patronage, there was no institutional memory left behind to allow others to continue the work. The second characteristic feature of the era related to the first was impermanence. Owing to the patronage system, there may have been a lot of spying, but there weren't many spies, at least not long-term ones. Nearly all worked only occasionally or were hired for one-time jobs to steal information or to perform some dark deed for uh, you know, raison d'etat. Frederick the Great, uh, for instance, paid one Friedrich Wenzel, a clerk in the Saxon archives, to sell him a copy of the Austro-Russian Alliance Treaty of 1746, with whose details I'm sure you're familiar. But, until, but unlike standard practice today, Frederick never thought of keeping Wenzel on as a mole able to pass on secrets like that for years. And the reason is that because there was no standing intelligence agency, Hefe Frederick could not train long-term agents in tradecraft or nail down secure means of transmission. It's revealing that while there were plenty of military manuals ap approving the use of spies, you know, all these military manuals of the, of the time saying, you know, general, it would be a great idea if you hired some spies, uh, none of them actually told their readers how to spy. There's, there's no book of spy tradecraft in the, in the 18th century. So in other words, there was no standard operating procedures to run agents in the field on a permanent basis. And it was all, so as a result, it was all ad hoc and improvised. Now, without knowing how to take these kinds of elementary precautions, many spies, predictably, didn't last long. Uh, a good example here is the unfortunate Dr. Henzi, who was an Irish physician, recruited as a French spy in London in the late 1750s. He didn't bother, he was probably one of the worst spies who, who ever lived. Uh, he didn't bother with a code, he left incriminating documents lying casually around his rooms, and he recycled the same low-grade intel, usually smatterings he picked up at the coffee house. Uh, he recycled among his patron, the Chevalier de Frey, who was, again, one of the world's worst intelligence uh, spy masters, and the Spanish and Austrian ambassadors. 
Now, you simply can't get away with that kind of sloppy trade craft uh, without being caught. And indeed, the post office, which was the British version of Kaunitz's black chamber, had in fact been intercepting all his mail from the get-go. Henzi was, of course, arrested and sentenced to hang, and he only saved his neck by snitching on all the other French spies in the capital, whose careers were soon similarly truncated, just unhelpfully, as the Seven Years' War was kicking off, when they might conceivably have been of some use. The Wenzel and Henzi episodes throw into relief the absence of ideology, religious or political, among spies at the time. This really shouldn't surprise us. The 18th century was a much more cosmopolitan time than our own in several respects because bonds of nationhood and shared citizenship would not truly emerge until the French Revolution, treason was defined differently than today. Today, you know, essentially it means that you've betrayed your country. Then it meant compassing the king's death or counterfeiting his coins. But if you weren't doing that stuff, then switching sides and working for a different king, and there were a lot of kings in Europe, was like someone today taking a job at a rival firm for better salary and benefits. Henry Lloyd, for instance, uh, was one of the most eminent soldiers of the age. Washington was a big fan of his uh, best-selling military textbook. Um, he was born in Wales, joined the French army against the Austrians, accompanied the Jacobites to Scotland to fight the English, then joined the Austrians against the Prussians, then the Prussians against the Austrians. This was during the same war. After which he fought with the Corsicans against the French and finally became a major general in the Russian army to fight the Turks all along serving as a British double agent and undertaking all sorts of secret service gigs. Now, this was regarded as perfectly normal behavior in many quarters. And I should add, this is an interesting point, um, that Benedict Arnold, was, who was Lloyd's contemporary and a man equally unburdened by ideology, you know, he was cut from the exact same cloth. Now, he wasn't anywhere near as successful as Lloyd, but they both worked in international market and soldiering and spying where the highest offers from the best patrons attracted the most talented servants. In Arnold's case, the British were bidding higher than the Americans for his services, and so the decision to change horses was made. For people like Arnold and Lloyd, spying was just <laughs> part of business for the most part. And as a splendidly clear-eyed Bavarian note explained in 1773, quote, uh, without money, one does not get far with these fellows. And that brings us to the third feature of 18th century spying, gentlemanliness. Now, of course, everyone knew money greased both skids and palms, but few talked about it because there was a class system within the secret world whose currency was honor. At the top, and so counted as honorable, obviously, were the diplomats and military officers. For nearly two centuries, ambassadors had circulated within their uh, host palaces and chanceries extracting gossip and policy scoops from courtiers and nobles. All of this was compiled into lengthy reports and sent to their home countries. And over time, after a few too many discretions, there was one Spanish ambassador who was asked to leave London owing to an impolite habit of instigating Catholic plots. A set of ground rules evolved about what was permissible to snoop into and what was off limits. And this up upper class etiquette eventually became as stiffly ritualized as kabuki theater. Also at the top was military intelligence, which was mostly the preserve of officers who were naturally gentlemen. This was the most ancient form of espionage, and you can find references to it in Thucydides, uh, Thucydides Homer, Julius Caesar. With that kind of pedigree, it was accordingly promoted by Europe's poshest commanders, like Maurice de Saxe, who, was, who gloried in the magnificent title of Marshal of all the armies of France and believed it was, quote, impossible to pay too much attention to spies. Now, this type of espionage focused on acquiring operational and tactical intelligence in the field, usually by dint of uniformed officers probing enemy fortifications and positions, while others specialized in the new science of cartography. The Duke of Marlborough, the greatest soldier of the eight, early 18th century, seems to have been the first to uh, appoint an actual intelligence chief while on campaign. This was during the War of the Spanish Succession. Um, this, this fellow in, 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 um, in particular was William Cadogan, who was later an earl, uh, well, actually the family still are earls, whose task was to estimate the location, provision, and strength of the enemy forces so that Marlborough could plan his counter moves and master strokes. Moving down this espionage hierarchy were the middle class cryptographers and clerks of the black, chamber, black chambers. These were respectable occupations, paid decently, and came with any number of benefits. 
A typical Viennese crypt analyst worked a shift of one week on, one week off, and was paid a lavish bonus whenever he cracked a new diplomatic code. At the same level were the merchants and engineers who pursued what we'd call industrial espionage. The French had long been particularly zealous in their efforts to, uh, as the euphemism has it, transfer te technology, especially in the metals, steam engine, glass, and textiles uh, sectors. 